Will you open your Bibles, please, at the Letter to the Romans, chapter 3, and we will begin reading at verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness of the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, and the Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith, and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham were justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted as a gift, was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one whom God counts righteous apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sins. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. This great passage introduces us to the perhaps the cardinal doctrine of the Christian faith, that is justification by faith. Every great truth of the gospel is grounded uh, on this great doctrine, or to change the metaphor, justification is the hub of the gospel wheel, the spokes and perimeter all being related to it. 
Now the definition of justification is this. It is the decree of God the divine lawgiver and judge, whereby according to his mercy and grace, he removes our guilt and condemnation once and for all, and reckons us righteous in the courts of divine justice, by imputing the righteousness of Christ to us, on the ground of the atoning work of Christ. Why do we need justification? Then the answer is twofold. All men and women and children are sinners. They have broken the law of God either in their consciences, if they have no revealed law, or in actual disobedience of the law that they know of. In the letter of John, chapter 3, a uh, chapter that is very well known, not only by Christians, but by non-Christians, especially that 16th verse, but listen to verses 18 and 36 of this great chapter. First of all, uh, verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in Jesus, that is, is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. We are condemned because we do not believe in the name of the Son of God or His work. In the 36th verse of this third chapter of John, it says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. That is from the Gospel of John. The Apostle Paul, in that great letter to the Romans that gives us the cardinal Christian doctrines, says in chapter 3 of the letter to the Romans and verse 9, What then? Are the Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written, None is righteous, no, not one. And in the 19th verse of Romans chapter 3, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. I remember once listening uh, to uh, a premier of Ontario at the prayer breakfast that I was attending way back in the 1970s, and he stood up and said, we politicians need to be told by you religious people that there's somebody out there to this very day, I wonder whether I should have stood up and said, one day you are going to face God. And as a lawyer, because he was uh, a lawyer, uh, every mouth will be stopped and all the world become uh, guilty before God. We need justification because we are sinners and we were born sinners. I didn't have to teach my son how to lie or cheat uh, or be jealous. These things came naturally from him. He didn't become a sinner when he sinned. He sinned because he was born as a sinner. Now, going on from this truth, we recognize it again in the uh, epistle to the Romans, chapter 5, and I could quote many verses, but I'll simply do two. In verse 12, therefore, therefore just as sin came into the world through man, 
and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, and so death was introduced by the created man, Adam, and in verse 15 uh, it tells us that the free gift is not like the trespass. One man, Adam, sinned and we are in solidarity with him. He was the federal head of humanity and uh, because he sinned it was imputed and transmitted to his progeny. And you'd better believe that if you want to be a true Christian because the same principle, that is the sin that was imputed by Adam to the human race, is also a principle by which God can justify you uh, as an unrighteous person and treat you as if you had never sinned. I remember just last year, was it, uh, the Raptors uh, won that great trophy and although I had not been watching the team uh, as so many others did, I remember joining all those people who said, we've won. Now it was the Raptors that did it as our representatives. Uh, we had nothing to do with it, really. But their win was something that was applied to us. And the sin of Adam was applied to us. And the righteousness of Jesus, as I shall show, is imputed to us. Let us look at the nature of justification. The word justified can be simplified. Think of it like this. Just as if. I'd never sinned, just as if I'd never sinned. How can God do that? How can God look at us like that? Well, first of all, uh, I hope my enunciation is good here. Justification is imputed, not imparted. That is, God does not make us morally holy, but he treats us as if we had never sinned, and the reason he can do that is our sin was imputed to Jesus. You can read that in 2 Corinthians 5.21, where it says, God made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus did not become a sinner, and we do not become morally holy when we are born again and justified by His grace, but God treats us as if we have never sinned. Now we can go right back to Abraham, who was justified by faith according to the fourth chapter of uh, this epistle. And Abraham is a very interesting person as we think of justification by faith. Because it tells us in the Word of God that he was justified by faith in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. He believed God and God imputed that faith to him and justified him. That is, treated him as if he had not sinned. Now, Abraham did sin significantly in the same way before he was justified and after he was justified. For instance, if you look at the uh, book uh, of Genesis, you will find in chapter 12 of Genesis that Abraham went into Egypt. Now he had what they would call today a very dishy wife. She would have been the uh, winner of Miss World uh, in the days when it was merely looking for beauty. And she was so beautiful that Abraham thought that people would kill him in order to have her. And he pretended that she was his sister in uh, the book of Genesis when he was in Egypt. And God closed the wombs of the, well, first of all, in this one, uh, he sent plagues. We're in the midst of COVID-19, as I record this message, and God sent plagues 
at that time on the household in the palace of Pharaoh and it was revealed to him that uh, he was about to sleep with another man's wife and God was punishing him and he forgave Abraham and sent him on his way. Then we read that Abraham was justified by faith but then afterwards in Genesis 20 he did it again. How could this great man do that? If we examine our own lives, we will realize that we often fall into the same sin as before. But listen to this. Even though he sinned before he was justified and then sinned again after he was justified, it didn't make a difference in his standing before God. God was upset and God chastens those he loves even though he doesn't punish them because he had punished the Lord Jesus Christ on their behalf. Now, this doesn't mean that we can go out and live any way that we like. In the letter of Peter, chapter 1 and verse 10, it says that we are to uh, make sure that we are the chosen of God by living godly lives. But living godly lives does not justify us with God. The blood of Jesus does that, as we shall see in just a moment. Because the grounds of our justification, the ultimate ground, is the mercy of God. In that great statement to Titus, uh, the Apostle Paul puts it like this, Titus chapter 3 in verses 5 through 7, he says, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that, being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We have eternal life as a result of the work of the Trinity of the Godhead, God's mercy and grace, the Holy Spirit's regeneration when we are born again, and the uh, work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It does not depend on man's desire, says the uh, New International Version at Romans 9.16 or our effort but on God's mercy. And so we have there then the grounds of justification and especially is it the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are, Romans 5.9, justified by his blood. In chapter 5 verse 18 we are justified by his righteousness. In the 19th verse of Romans 5, read these glorious words. It was justified by his obedience, not our obedience. And we are justified in his name, according to 1 Corinthians 6 and 11. Now, the immediate ground of our justification is this great verse in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that God made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I sometimes put it like this. If God keeps a file on your sin and you are justified by God's grace on the grounds of the redemption of the Lord Jesus and the shedding of his blood on Calvary's cross and he's going into the glory to pray for you. If God looks for your file, guess what? He can't find it because your sin was placed upon our blessed and beloved Lord when he on the cross cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because of your sin and my sin. But his righteousness is now imputed to us as our sin was imputed to him. Now the means of uh, justification, pardon, being sought from an offended God who son shed his blood, is faith. By grace are you saved through faith, 
and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. In the early apostolic preaching, in Acts chapter 13, for instance, and verse 39, Acts 13 and 39, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. And then again coming to this glorious chapter, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, we have these immortal words, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not on account of our faith, but through it, because God gives us the very faith to believe in Him. What are the results of justification? Romans 5, 1, peace with God. 1 John 5, 10 through 12, eternal life. And Romans chapter 8, verse 30, even tells us that whom he justified, them he also glorified. It's so certain that we'll be glorified that God can use the past tense in that great 8th uh, chapter. The work of the Trinity in justification, it's the Father who sends Jesus, it's the Son who acts to redeem us, and the Holy Spirit who applies it to us. Be justified, not on your works, not on your striving, not even on your prayers, but look to Jesus, for he alone justifies the sinner by faith on account that his blood was shed for you as you put your trust in him. May God bless you, and may you be not only justified, but anticipate being glorified. Amen.